So here, now we move into the animus. Now this is really uh, the same concept that supports the anima, but instead we're dealing now with a female ego and the male animus complex in the unconscious. So the animus constitutes all of the hidden masculine qualities in a woman's psyche. Her creativity, tenacity, character, and convictions arise from this unconscious source. The animus will often appear in mysterious forms. As a rule, the animus is primarily shaped by the father, but unlike the anima in a man's case, the animus is built up by a kind of jury. Uncles, older brothers, doctors, teachers, and a variety of male figures work together in constructing a woman's animus. So the animus, unlike the anima, is built up of a collection of experiences. A young woman will build up her ideas and images of the ideal man based on a variety of forms and a variety of experiences. The personification of physical power and aggression is the first stage in a young woman's experience of the animus. This is sort of the James Dean complex, right? She wants to be with a bad boy, the rascal, the motorbike guy, right? This is the, the, the young adolescent girl who is seduced by an older young man who represents an opportunity for adventure and danger, right? If she matures and grows out of this, he will eventually evolve into possessing initiative and capacity for planned action. She'll begin looking for a man who is a leader or a warrior. Here also the animus becomes a source of romantic feelings, romantic love. And finally, when she moves up into the final two stages, she will be looking for a man who is a man of the word, a writer, a clergyman, professor, or instructor of the people, the shaman. And finally, she has to recognize the animus as being meaning incarnate. The animus here becomes the mediator between the ego and the self. So you see, it follows a very similar pattern as the anima, where we start out with the basic sort of sexual feelings, moving up then into romance, and then finally into more deep and profound realizations of the anima and animus as inner realities within, within the woman or within this, you know, the, the man in the case of the anima. So the negative animus is the problem of a woman. And here we can have it described. It says here, uh, the main inheritance a woman takes from her impressions of her father are a collection of psychological absolutes, unarguable, incontestable, true convictions that never include the personal reality of the woman as she actually is. She'll speak of always should or ought to. And you can see this, especially in uh, middle-aged women, you know, where they, they get very rigid minds, you know, where they, they're very closed off to their creativity at some point, and, you know, everything becomes an absolute. Everything is an absolute. This is the way that it is, and it can't be any other way, and it doesn't take into account uh, her reality. So this this is the result of uh, experiencing a father figure or a set of male father figures who are just too stubborn, <laughs> you know, too strict, and this can really have a negative impression on the young girl. So the animus is responsible for the semi-conscious, cold, destructive reflections that invade a woman in the small hours, especially when she has failed in some obligation of feeling. This negative animus inspires women to conspire, to weave webs of fantasy and thought, indulging in daydreams centered on personal gain. This negative animus will wish death on loved ones and friends secretly. When one of us dies, I'll move to the Riviera, said one woman to her husband when she saw the beautiful Mediterranean coast, a thought that was rendered relatively harmless by reason of the fact that she said it. So, <laughs> this is an example out of, out of Carl Jung's book. And, you know, the, you, you can kind of paint the scene in your mind where this woman's standing on a boat and she says to her husband, when one of us dies, I'll move to the Riviera. Well, it's pretty clear who she's assuming is going to die in that scenario. And when he pointed it out to her, she said that it was harmless because she said it. This is a perfect example of the stubborn, rigid, and toxic animus lurking in the female psyche. This is, number one, it's a, it's a, a, a very cruel thing to say. When one of us dies, I'll move to the Riviera, as if to say, you know, as soon as this asshole croaks, I can get on with my life. And uh, second of all, it's, it's hideous in the fact that her excuse for it is the fact that she said it. I mean, it's, it's absurd to, to suggest that this is acceptable, right? But you see this in women, especially, I hate to say it, but middle-aged women especially, you know, they, they, they lose their relationship with the animus and uh, they, they, they don't mature in terms of their relationship with this masculine aspect of themselves. And so it degenerates into something like this. 
This is often when women get divorced, I think, by the way. This this can really cause a lot of problems in, in marriages. Same with men, though. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make it sound like I'm being entirely hard on women here. Men have just as many problems with their animus. Men to the left because women are always right. This is an example of this stubborn animus in the unconscious. So here's a short clip. This represents the experience of a young woman who is progressing in her relationship towards the animus. Because you see, in a, unlike a male, the animus to a woman is often dark, which really creates an interesting situation. Because you have, for, for, for women, oftentimes only negative dreams. You know, you have to recognize here that a woman has a shadow archetype, right? And then she has the animus archetype. But the animus is often mysterious, dark, even threatening. So that the boundary between her shadow and her animus can be really difficult to distinguish. In fact, they can be all blurred together. So that simultaneously, the things she hates and loathes most about herself are confusingly all mixed together with the things she yearns and desires for the most. And the whole process of overcoming these na negative aspects of yourself while simultaneously growing in your relationship with the animus is a great struggle. And it's the process of stripping the animus of all of its negative qualities so as to extract this purified form that becomes the ideal male in her life. And we see this expressed beautifully in The Beauty and the Beast. So the conscious attention that a woman has to give her animus problem takes much time and involves generally suffering. And this is true for men as well. I don't want to give the impression like only women have a difficult time with this, right? <laughs> but if she realizes who and what her animus is and what he does to her, and if she faces these realities instead of allowing herself to become possessed, her animus becomes an invaluable inner companion, endowing her with the masculine qualities of initiative, courage, objectivity, and spiritual wisdom. At the highest level, the animus, like the anima, becomes the mediator between the self and the ego. He enriches and fills her life with new dimensions of meaning, wisdom, and insight. He offers the woman spiritual firmness, an invisible inner support that compensates for any outward softness. Thus, the animus must undergo a kind of transformation, turning the negative views of masculinity around into positive virtues of strength, independence, and dependability. Now, if you're looking for an example of a mature animus, I think this clip right here really encapsulates what a mature, developed animus will look like functioning through a woman. Dear friends, on the 9th of October 2012, the Taliban shot me on the left side of my forehead. They shot my friends too. They thought that the bullet would silence us. But they failed. And out of that silence came thousands of voices. The terrorists thought that they would change my aims and stop my ambitions. But nothing changed in my life except this. Weakness, fear, and hopelessness died. Strength power, and courage was born. You know, it's a beautiful scene because, I mean, you've got this young woman wearing a pink hijab, you know, I mean, she's no more than probably four or five feet tall, I mean, and you can hear the power in her voice. And that power doesn't come from her femininity, right? That power, that power is coming from the man that's inside of her, her inner masculinity. A masculinity that she probably developed in large part due to a positive relationship with some male figure in her life. There must have been some male influence in her life that enabled her to understand how to recognize the masculinity within herself as a, port, as, a, as a source of power, strength, and courage, just as she describes it. So beautiful, wonderful. It's a great, great moment there. 